Dude. So you never responded about the bet. Yeah, I'm glad I didn't take it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did. Uh, he texted me about it, but okay. he never answered. He never, he never answered. You gave so. him the terms, and you got cold feet. Yeah, thank God I did. But now maybe this is a good sign for Eternals. Yeah, you could look at it like that. <laughs> no, I think you would have lost that bet. Asian community really showed out for that. <laughs> yes, you and just the American community. Yeah, you'd still accept the terms. No, I don't want to accept it. <laughs> yeah, come on, accept the terms, man. It's a fun bet. It's a podcast bet. Actually, what the terms? actually, I will because I have no trust here, so <laughs> I'll rock with it. Let me see. Let me see who you're working with first. That's oh, looking to hurt. And your back? I don't have back hair. Arms? I, I guy, you said chest hair. You didn't say fucking full body. I'll take it. Oh, All I right. thought we were doing full body. You should have taken it because he's a hairy man. Oh no, I did. I just took it. We just shook on it. Okay, but for for full body, no, he would have been in. What I can't hair? do that to him. He would have been agonized. He shaved his arms now. I don't shave my arms. Like, oh, <laughs> my God. What First, are you, a fucking high school gym coach? No, I trim them. And <laughs> high school you gym You trim coach. your arms? You can't <laughs> just trim them. Dude, because look, right here, you can probably see it right now. It's probably still coming in. You see how, like, sporadic and, like, weird that is? It grows weirdly, so I have to keep it in shape. And then if I just do one part, and it just looks uneven, so I just trim the hairs. And my chest, too. So you shave? <laughs> yeah, you know, I trim, I trim. <laughs> You're not well, waxing it, at least. Well, that's the bet. We don't even tell what the bet was because we had the bet uh, last podcast. What would do better at the box office, Eternals or Shang- uh, Shang-Chi? And you picked Eternals, and we were trying to think of punishments. And I just so happened to be watching 40-Year-Old Virgin. I'm like, that's hilarious. <laughs> I'm going to make Teddy do that. So what's Chi sitting at right now? So you're going to have to get, you're gonna get <laughs> your chest wax. Like 150 worldwide. Is it? Just broke the Labor Day weekend box office record, which, I mean, it's competition. Most movies don't come out Labor Day weekend. I got 200 for Eternals. Uh, well, internationally, it's made 150. So I think domestically, it's made close to 100, and then in other ter- territories, it's made about like 54 million. What's the in bet? International territory. International or domestic? It's, no, it's worldwide. Yeah, worldwide box. Worldwide. All right. I think uh, y- you need time for Eternals to uh, accumulate. What's the time period then? Two weeks? No, you're thinking like Opening a weekend? month, maybe a month. A month and a half. Right. Well, if it passes before then, then yeah, I'll just have to get my chest waxed. All right, cool. Right. Which, or if you see it like creeping on it, you're gonna want to extend it. You know, like, <laughs> the re-release. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be a non. This is gonna be a bet until we're <laughs> yeah. so many times I gonna yeah. fucking re-release it. That's gonna be like sequels count, right? Because <laughs> I did it with so much confidence, but now that you just said that, that might be good for Eternals too. Like, <laughs> I'm kind of like. I know. Yeah, this is opening the floodgates. Here. So since Endgame is kind of part of Eternals, I did it. Pres- <laughs> I said just picture Teddy as Steve Carell right there, me laughing at him like that's hilarious. I need that to happen, and I thought this was a layup, and I think it still is a layup. So thanks for shaking on it. I hope it is. Even after <laughs> the weekend it had. Real, real smart, Ted. I think Eternals got it. I'm riding it. Bigger cast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Suit Podcast. I am Bo Oliver, joined here today with Aaron, the Nerd Suit Monkey, and Teddy, and we are here to talk about the world of movies, Hollywood, TV, video games, all that stuff. Of course, listen to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube, and follow us on social media at Nerd Soup, Noid Soup. Uh, Bo Soup, Nerd Soup Monkey, Teddy Nerd Soup. Forgot your handles. We haven't. It feels like we haven't been together. Been us while. three. It's been a while. Yeah. Some time. Yeah, you guys have been dodging me. No, right, yeah, we schedules. almost replaced you with Matt. Close. Right, schedule, schedules. Yeah. That's good, man. You gotta look out. He knows his stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's why he's doing what he's doing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like when the uh, Three Stooges replaced Curly with uh, Shemp, I think his name was. I didn't but it changes the dynamic. Shambo. Then we become yeah. we become the Teddy. But Curly was better. Yeah. <laughs> right, you guys want exactly. that? <laughs> you, guys, you guys don't want that burden. <laughs> uh, yeah, when it came to the f- festivals, we were just asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that's the next time you're going to hear us. We'll be live in, from Toronto. Not live, but we'll be in Toronto. Live from Toronto. It's the Nerd Soup Podcast. We got our tickets today to do in Ted. Hey. Not a big deal. Yeah, we're seeing Dune Saturday, Ted. Good for you guys. I'm happy for you. 12 p.m. noon. I was shaking a Scroll little because I didn't know how it worked with like the like the press redemptions. Like if we don't do it fast enough, it's just gonna be gone. But we got I, hope it. It, I hope it sucks. To be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> just hope it's a fucking travesty. Either a flop, or I hope something goes wrong with the film and like it breaks and you guys can't watch <laughs> films. That's on fire. Is it, is it one of those going. like real films? You think? Probably. Yeah, it's a festival. It's got to be. Yeah, I hope. I hope like someone somebody sat, back there someone changing it. the reels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a bad friend. Yeah, it is terrible. I'm just saying, if I can't enjoy it, I want you guys to enjoy it. Hey, man, maybe hopefully we'll get that press screener just where we live. 
instead of going to fucking Toronto. <laughs> Maybe Warner Brothers will hook us up, and then yeah, you guys we, excited? If we get oh two, oh my god! Yeah. All right, so we said if we get if we get in, for, we get probably get two passes, right? Now, if we see it already, does that mean Teddy still has like? Is that the right thing to do? Yes. If, if you guys get, see it, and get I don't two. get the pass for here. I'm out of the pod. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that'll be fair. You're probably working though. I'll I'll figure something out. Actually, yeah, that's the other thing. You got to make sure your schedule is fucking. Clean. My uh, speak speaking of work, my driving temper has mm. been getting a lot better, dude. Today, when you get it's something about this city, worse. bro. When you get cut off in the city, you just expect it because it's like, all right, we're all trying to move, we're all trying to go somewhere. So you just get cut off. Like, all right, you're you're, you're pretty much like you're waiting for it to happen. So you're always on like edge. But when you get cut off in on Long Island, it's a threat. <laughs> Dude, I get so much more mad when I get cut off on Long Island. So we're driving, um, we're on Sun State, um, we're just driving, you know, and this lady, she was on the right side, like she was just getting on from the, like she was just getting onto the highway. Oh, from the merge, she was merging in. And before, you know how it's like a solid line and yeah, there's little dot lines? She crossed the, the solid line right fucking next to me, cut me <laughs> off, and had the audacity, I had to go into, if there was someone in the lane next to me, I would have hit them. Cause that's how aggressively she went and like she didn't wait for me to go didn't like she had plenty of time to go yeah and then like she literally just came right into my side and i had to dodge her while she's staring at me yelling at me giving me the fucking finger <laughs> Dude, she flipped me off same thing happened to me driving home i took ocean parkway home to avoid traffic the exact same thing happened to me a guy was turning from gilgo getting ready to merge on and he just uh, he just, she, ignored. just she, she just went yeah. and had the audacity when i, I beeped so i'm like hey look out i'm coming she gave me the finger I'm like, right, fuck you. Well, right. not only did you beat, you had to finger. avoid hitting her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were on in two lanes, and then she just decided to flip us off. I got her back, though. Typical long out. Yeah, you, you got, got her back? What'd you do? Gave her the finger back. All right. I would have laid on the horn right behind her the entire way home. <laughs> I, wa- I wanted to catch car. up to her, but she took off like a bad <laughs> hell. No, she did. She was. She, she didn't want it. the smoke anymore. Yeah. She yeah. seemed a little shook. Two guys in the Kia? I don't blame her. <laughs> That's bad news. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two guys in a Kia. Oh, man, that was scary. And you know, like, the whole way home, like, you just have that heart rate. So I was like, just going to say, like, like, now your heart's racing the whole fucking ride. Yeah, I don't like that. Sweating. That's why I try to avoid road rage. Because yeah, it just you worked too up. hype. Yeah, too much adrenaline. I mean, I looked at Bo, I'm like, like, yeah, that was her, right? Like, <laughs> He's like, yeah, definitely. Like, yeah, no, she just wouldn't merge. She was being a hesitant driver, wouldn't merge in, and then decided to did. merge in at the wrong time. <laughs> Uh, well, that, that was part of my story. It was like I was going to tell that story. That guy cut me off, and I, you know, cooler has prevailed. Right you in know, the city, you have it. to. You're going to cut some people off yourself. Yeah, exactly. That's just how the city is, right? Just what you do. You, you know, everyone's trying to go somewhere. Because we were rushing home. We weren't rushing home, but like we you want to get home. We were cutting it close. No, because we had a because uh, the tickets, the redemptions dropped at two, so we had to be ready at two just to click all the things we want to see in our schedule. So if we would have been late, then we probably and then it got dropped fucked. early. Man, you guys had a day today, huh? Yeah, we've done a lot. I'm going to put the fucking Queens. I'm surprised you guys want to do the pod still. Westbury, back, Queens, back, pod. And we're going to spend the next week with each other. We're going to fucking kill it. We're going to grind. Yeah, you guys are going to hate each other. The pod might not make it. No, because we're going to be watching so many movies going back and forth. We're going to be exhausted. There's not going to be bickering because we're not going to be but interacting. We're going to be mics, exhausted right? and like in like not great mood. So every little thing one of us does is going to make the other mad. You guys bring mics? Yes. Nice. I've already said that if, like, the podcast ends because of this, but if we see Dune, it's, like, well, worth it. Yeah, it's worth it. Worth it. It's worth it. Yeah. What do I do, though? I'm going to be in film mode, so don't even speak to me. You're going like, to sit <laughs> with, like, your hands, like... Yeah, I'm just going to be... It's going to be Dave Rothenberg while he's watching Giants. I heard exactly. he's a fucking menace, dude. Yeah. Don't talk to him. Don't talk to me about my kid. Don't talk to me about <laughs> my family. Save all emergencies until after the movies. <laughs> we need to get into these topics, but when okay. Endgame came out and uh, the dude gave a list to his girlfriend of all the things she couldn't do if she wanted to watch Endgame <laughs> with him. It's like there's going to be a pre and post discussion. Uh, pay attention to the movie so you can make valid points. Just if you want to if you want to watch it with me. <laughs> yeah. It's like I am not a father to our child for these three hours. <laughs> you will handle Don't all even emergencies. Look at me. <laughs> all right, let's get to the first story here. We have Shang-Chi. Shang-Chi, actually. We Been, reviewing it? Or? Yeah, no, we're going to review it. We're going to talk about it. Mm. We're going to talk about the box office, what that means. Ted, you can throw in your questions or... You could sit on your phone for 15, 20 minutes. I'll do the second one. Cool. Um, yeah, Shang-Chi, I've been saying it wrong all this time, but it has come out, finally. It's been a movie that's been plagued by pushbacks. Well, to be fair, for uh, New Yorkers, 
they're very uh, prone to just pronounce how they read it and yeah, stick to it and don't even move it. Yeah, Shang Chi. Yeah, <laughs> that's whatever's easiest to come out to. Well, I want to ask should you, stick to it. Is does it have to be Shang Chi now, or like can I still say Shang Chi? Like it no, might be well, now that you well, now that you know, you should go with the current. Well, Shang Chi is kind of like the California na- accent because in California, Sean is Sean, okay. so Shang. So we could just pretend we're Californians. I like that. Nah, I'd rather not. I don't, have the, I don't have California. The, I just don't have the vibe. Yeah, you don't. Have, uh, kinda. It's a completely different vibe. I feel it's like the you're whole slow. East Coast. There's something to the East Coast West Coast beef. Again, there, you're shaving your arms. Different vibes. I fuck. I trim. Yeah, you go there's to the difference. city. You turn it to the. <laughs> Do you want me to just be a hairy mess with hair protruding from all no, avenues? No, I yeah. like it. Just don't. You don't got to run from that. You shave. You turn it to Courage the Cowardly Dog when you get into the city. Don't don't bring this back on me. I'm just talking <laughs> about just the. Yeah, but you're acting like you're such a New Yorker. Like you're Mr. A, I'm walking here. No, I do be walking. You do, yeah, you do be, do be walking. Mm-hmm. All right, Shang-Chi. It's doing well at the box office. <laughs> it's literally single-handedly saving movies. Yeah, well, I guess if you want to talk about the, the film itself first. Yeah, let's talk about the film itself. What did you think, Aaron? I thought it was, like, I think I put it, I forgot what, exactly what, in, like, in my MCU rankings, but it's definitely second tier. Marvel. I think a lot. Um, I think a lot of like my po- the positives for me was that obviously I thought it was a great introduction to the story, but I think that easily one of the better villains in the MCU as a whole, and just the depth and backstory they gave to those characters, his parents, I thought was probably what the movie d- did best. And for a lot of times, it was like obviously you knew it was a Marvel movie, but it kind of created its own lore and kind of created its own thing, and it, it ve- felt felt very much. Like, it could just be a action-adventure fantasy movie right. for a lot of it. And obviously, it, but I think as it, like, progressed and got more connected to Marvel stuff, I think that took away a lot of it. Especially, um, like, in the second act, it's, like, a really big connection that they go into. And I think... Um, a lot of times when they kind of hit that quote-unquote formula is where it kind of felt started to feel more familiar and kind of lost some of its uniqueness. But I do think it was very, uh, for the most part, it was a unique entry into the MCU. And then you had the third act, which I think, you know, I said this to someone I was talking to, it's like sometimes less is more. And I think that should have been a more uh, intimate, uh, less CGI explosion of a third act. And I think I would have enjoyed that a lot more. But I don't think any of my negatives really take away from it. I think it's a solid... I gave it like a 7.8, but now that I like sat on it and really think about it, it's definitely like a solid in the eights, low eights. And I think that's kind of what um, I was expecting going into it. Yeah, the third act was so much. It, it was, was too a lot much at for times, me. yeah. Uh, I think uh, so many of these origin stories, like Wonder Woman, like Black Panther, Black Panther didn't need that battle at the end. It just needed the confrontation between T'Challa and Killmonger. This movie... We got that confrontation between Shang-Chi and his father, who was played brilliantly by Tony Leung. And I think if Tony Leung doesn't deliver the performance that he did as this villain, this is one of the lower tier Marvel movies. For me, it's middle of the pack. It's a a mixed bag where there's more good than there is bad. But the first half, low to the ground, one of the smallest budgets for an MCU origin movie. And it shows. It was just about Shang-Chi's ability to beat the crap out of people with his own two hands. The best sequence in the movie for me was the bus sequence. When he's showing off the kung fu, when he's able to keep everything, just he's holding on to everything by a thread, but he still manages to wiggle his way out of it. Aquafina as the comic relief. You love her or hate her? I happen to be someone who loves Aquafina. I just she was think good. She's I funny. liked her in this. Right. So their their relationship that was a bit different. Keeping it platonic, they're just friends. Uh, she's just a buddy who has his back. Um, using the flashbacks to get into their origin story, to, to get into his origin story, the dynamic that he shared with his family, which is so important to this movie. When you had that strong family dynamic, you don't need a third act that blows the budget. Because at times, I didn't even know what I was watching in the third act, and I couldn't get my mind off of Black Panther, which is, to me, a better film. But it's the same exact problem, mm-hmm. where it's CGI monsters and creatures that we don't we just were introduced to, and they do set up their own lore. But I don't think that was necessary. I didn't think that much world building was really necessary for this character, especially because the development for Tony Lung is just he's been around for a thousand years. He's a bad guy, yeah, and that's kind of all you needed because he's so charismatic in the role. Um, but the family stuff was so strong and so yeah. complex. 
that I just needed a family confrontation. I needed an intervention. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> More I, so than a CGI fight. I think the backstory into his, his parents' relationship and that was all very well done. And add, add that may so, be the best scene so in the movie. So much depth to the characters. Right. Um, but when I meant like their own lore, I, I, I don't mean like what we saw in the second half. I meant in the beginning, like little glimpses into that world where he just found the Ten Rings and he was using them and he did meet his soon to be future wife and then her powers and in that area. I felt like all of that felt very good. Yeah. We got a little taste of it. We didn't get too much, but we kind of got a great, a good sense of kind of where uh, his ancestors come from, where his parents come from and where he is now. And I it's think just such an easy way out to make. That's good, right? Building mm-hmm. up where she's from, her origins. But I think it's just such an easy way out to make it, they're just an army. They're just a mystical army at the end of the day, protecting a door. And if the door gets broken, then the world is going to end. Mm-hmm. I just wanted something more of, you know, obviously he, he has very complex emotions towards his father. So I wanted to see that hashed out between the two of them or between the three of them, because his sister was a character that I didn't expect going in to come out loving so much. Mm-hmm. Um but I just needed a, a, a one-on-one or a one-on-one-on-one instead of the dragons. <laughs> right, yeah. I. Uh... And it's like we have to give Aquafina something to do, so she's got the bow and arrow, and then her teacher died. Oh, that's sad. The problem with we these big... so many times yeah. in superhero origins movies. And I think it was different in the terms of, like, the different uh, creatures and the different weaponry and the different fighting styles. Um, but I, I like, especially like with the martial arts aspects and like the first two acts when they're fighting in the building. And I thought that was one of the most, probably one of the more beautiful scenes, like in that shot with the lights coming in from the city mm-hmm. and that fight sequence and the hand to hand stuff. But they kind of got away from that when they did it into the big CGI battle. And it kind of, um, what that does, I feel like sometimes is it doesn't do a great job of creating tension at, or like wanting to know the outcome because you kind of know the outcome already. It's ne- never when I was watching that was I like, oh, these guys are interesting. And that's the problem with every origin story. But right. I think uh, when it's done right, you can still build that tension. But when there's so much going on, you're not really focusing too much on the individual characters and you're kind of going from all over the place. You can't, you're kind of just like, okay. I get what's happening. I appreciate it. It looks good. I'm having fun, but ultimately, don't go on for another 20 minutes because I know what's going to happen. And it right. gets to the point where it's like they're about to win, but then something happens, and you're like, oh, just let them win already. I want to see. I'm more interested in the resolution here than the actual sequences that's happening. Yeah, and they could have avoided that because of how complex a family relationship was. We could have felt that same those same conflicting emotions with Shang Chi. What is he going to do with his father? What is the ultimate decision here? Do I kill him? Do I allow him to live? And they did that so well by developing this character, a man who was evil. He finds the right woman. She reforms him, and he becomes a good person. He loses that, and then he loses sight of his humanity once again. So it's not even the the villain at the height of his powers, because he does put down the rings because of this new woman. And all of that was set up so beautifully. It is, like I keep saying, it, it is very complex. That's what you should focus on in your third act. So it doesn't get bogged down in more predictable outcomes like his father sacrificing himself to save his son. That could have been, you could have got that, you could have gotten to that point in a less predictable manner. I'm not bashing it. Obviously, I did enjoy it. But a lot of the smaller elements are the elements that that I really enjoyed. What I wanted most out of this movie was the hand-to-hand combat. Shang-Chi just beating the crap out of people. We got that. We got that at the underground fighting ring. We got the cameo from Wong, mm-hmm. which was hilarious, fighting against Abomination. And his, his sister was a... Uh, it's in the trailer. It's in the sorry. trailer. All right. He's fighting Abomination in the trailer. <laughs> this guy just gave us a death stare. Uh, and like I, I mentioned, her, her, uh, the, <laughs> the First supporting of all, character. Now. Of, I, I'm, this weekend, I'm going to catch up on some movies. I think I'm pronouncing this wrong, but Yu Yin Ling, I think her name was, Shang-Chi's sh- sister. A standout character, a character that I would love to see more of moving forward. I thought she left such a lasting impression, her and Tony Long. Simu Liu is, I really like him as a person. I like how enthusiastic he's been about this franchise, but I think they made him the least interesting part of this movie because all the the standouts are the supporting characters. I found him to be very likable. Um, but yeah, most of the attention is giving to the supporting characters. Um, most of the, I think his like it's hard because a lot of his development ties in with those characters as well. So it's kind of like a shared art, but like 
I, I do think there was a it was a like, calculated move to uh, make maybe his father. Yeah, I'd say more. I was gonna say like e- either just as or even more important in this movie. As I wonder if his the, father uh, has more lines of dialogue. Probably because in Black Panther they made him the straight man, but it was more he's cool, calm. He's kind of above all the emotions of what's happening in his world. With Shang Chi, I just I think they forgot to make him interesting, um, and that's something that they can develop in a sequel. Well, That's kind of the Thor. give or take, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good point. Th- actually, Thor. I won. find him to be much more likable than Thor was in the first two movies. Right. I-, I think it's also a symptom of these origin movies, where you see a movie like you know Doctor Strange got a lot of the focus in his origin movie, but he's really not that interesting. Mm-hmm. Kind of reminds you of other characters you've already seen, and that's how I felt with Shang Chi as well. Um, I don't. I don't know if giving him a bit more personality. I mean, I think that would make the movie better if he was a bit more personable. He is likable, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that he's the main character and he's beating up the bad guys. Yeah, you know? that's... and he's good at portraying the physicality of the role. He looks like a movie star. He looks like uh like he belongs with the Avengers. It's it's just more so I think on writing than anything else that they made everybody else so colorful. But th- those parts are the... so good though. Like that doesn't right. really. I mean, if you want to. Especially because we're going to get more of this character going forward and probably take more of a uh, center stage in future team-up movies and whatnot and even even other movies. Like, we're going to get more of this character, more development. And, like, with with the fa- like with this father, like, that's he's just – that's it. So it's like if that's going to be a one and done, then, like, yeah, give him – Give him an intriguing backstory. Give him that development because that's only going to further, uh, that's only going to make the movie better. And with this character, you have plenty of time in sequels and other movies to go deeper into him and let more of his personality show. Right. Um, yeah, I think they did a better job with T'Challa because T'Challa is dealing with a lot of the same things. How do I stand in my father's shoes? Not the same things, but how do I grapple with my father's legacy? Because T'Challa learns near the middle of the film that his father wasn't a perfect man. He has to grapple with that. How am I going to remedy this? Or how do I now become my own man apart from my father? And Shang-Chi is more so like, I need to not be my father's mm-hmm. man, but he is my father. I still love him. There were times, there were good times. I think the only interesting part of his character, not the only, but the main focus is that my dad is a dick. Mm -hmm. There's not really much more after that. Um, But like I said, I imagine that's something that they'll get to in the sequels. I thought the end credit scene was fucking hilarious. But mom's like, your life's going to change forever. Get get some sleep. And they go do karaoke instead. (laughs) I think like some of the comedy hit for me, but some of it was really... It was hit or miss. There's nothing I really hi- hi- like. Really thought back to and was like, oh yeah, let me quote that line for line. That was pretty funny. Well, it looked like they were letting Aquafina do her own thing. It wasn't yeah. the traditional Marvel humor. It was Aquafina. I think humor. a lot of times they, they did try to shoehorn a lot of that in. And but when it got to Trevor, that's when I thought it was at its worst. Even though it was fun seeing him there. Yeah. And it's, that's really it's where funny it's tra- in the mo- in yeah. the moment. But that, looking back, it's like that's not going to be funny when you rewatch this movie. Yeah, because that's like what I was talking about, like when it was kind of operating in its own zone, and then that comes in, and it's fully like I don't know, it just it just detracted a bit from me. But over like, like you said, like I, I loved all like the setup, the flashbacks. Usually, with like some movies, flashbacks can be a I don't know, they could just be uninteresting or really disrupt the flow of the movie. I thought this this was perfect use of it. Yes, they added them in at the right times, gave you. Uh, bits and pieces here to kind of help you put the puzzle together of their backstory of their life and what happened and I think it really added a lot um, the Ten Rings themselves is just a fucking cool weapon the way he used them too he, he was such a badass the way he would propel himself they were awesome yeah like, that's like that's probably one of my like favorite weapons now one MCU. of the best flashbacks right well some people were talking you know, how powerful is Shang-Chi now with those rings and how powerful was he obviously was someone who maintained his power for hundreds and hundreds of years but my favorite flashback is when his mother is first killed and his father goes to find the killers and he just decimates that room of mm-hmm. of gangsters and he looks back at his son and he's like you know you're all right <laughs> like you want to hit up the next spot we're gonna find your mom's killers you know we're bonding right mm-hmm. uh michelle Yu as the auntie character who was related to shang chi's mother you know, she's such a great presence in any movie that she's in. Uh, she doesn't have much screen time, but that's what happens when you stack your cast full of great actors. You know, they leave impressions with, with those limited lines of dialogue or, or screen time. 
And who else was I going to talk about supporting characters? Oh, and like uh, his father's henchman. Uh, I enjoyed the dude with the blade arm. He was scary, right? He was a good no-name henchman type of guy. Yeah. Um, and the power itself, where does his power go now? Because it, it's in Shang-Chi's hands. You imagine that his sister is going to have something to say with uh, about that now that she's the new leader of the Ten Rings. That was, I, I mean, <laughs> I think she had the more interesting arc because she's doing... Uh, f- I mean, not she's not a villain, but she's working in the underworld. She's working with less than reputable characters within the MCU. She's in a way, she's a criminal. Yeah. Um, and then she has to get brought back into this fight, and you you see her good side when she comes back to save her brother after he left her all those years ago, and now she's possibly one of the head honcho villains moving forward in the MCU, right? Depending on how strong this organization still is. Or she can build them back up because it looks like they were a bit depleted. Yeah. I think, yeah, that, I think that makes for like a great Disney Plus series. I'm more excited to see her than I am any other character in this in this uh, movie. I mean, the, the end credit scene was probably like... What an end credit scene, Ted. Oh. Oh, yeah. I don't oh. want to say anything. <laughs> yeah, we shouldn't even talk about it. Just not to ruin it for Ted. Okay. But it's fucking incredible. One of the better ones. It was, um... What movie was it? Previewing. <laughs> it wasn't previewing anything. We just gotta fucking talk about it, man. You, you care? No, no, no. All right. Well, Shang-Chi and Wong... No. Don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm gonna say it. Okay. Well, the, the, okay, the people who have seen it will know what we're talking about. But it, I it's... didn't expect to see that one character look different. Yeah. Uh, I think they'll know who we're talking the about. Hulk. And I didn't expect to see that <laughs> other character Is the Hulk at all. Right. <laughs> Professor Hulk? No, he's Mark Ruffalo. Wow. They're, um, really? They have like a, a meeting, like a remote meeting to examine the power of the Ten Rings. And it's Hulk, Wong, and Captain Marvel. And it's Hulk as Mark Just Mark Ruffalo. Ruffalo. Yeah, he's back to Bruce. Oh, so we figured it he's out. He's got a sling. Is your shoulder still fucked? Oh, yeah, he's really? got a sling. But it seems to be setting up something. Yeah, the next, slingering, huh? Yeah. It's setting up a lot, so... The yeah. Slings 4, baby. That's just so, like... How is this tying, tying into Kang? I hate that. You tell me what comic like, I watched, like, two hours of, like, a pr- like a, a good movie. I know. And then, like, the thing I'm, like, excited about is, like, the 10-second scene just because they showed characters. Yeah. Uh, you tell me Wakanda can't heal this guy's arm or shoulder. <laughs> You'd think, right? Yeah. Those Infinity Stones leave quite the uh, quite the scar. Yeah, I mean, it killed, killed Iron Man. Took out Thanos' arm and the Hulk's arm. Yeah, yeah. You see how fucked up Run Thanos was? <laughs> yeah. Can't put SBH uh, 50 on that bitch. <laughs> and uh, the second scene was great, too. I mean, nobody being aware of the power of the Ten Rings is also an interesting wrinkle. Captain Marvel having her history. Um, I, I forget what Bruce said specifically about it that made it mysterious. But it looks like a power that's going to be reoccurring within the MCU. Then maybe Shang-Chi has the rings for now, but they end up in somebody else's hands. Or they become something that needs to be used in order to defeat Kang. Because <laughs> that man's coming. Yeah. I'm excited, though. I'm excited for Shang-Chi because I like how he is... Listen, the Ten Rings is a, an incredible power, but when he's just fighting on his own... I, I, lo- I love those types of heroes, especially in the team-up movies. Like when Batman's running around with the Justice League, he has no business being there. It's like, why is Shang-Chi here? Well, he's really good at Kung Fu. They surprise you, you know, and they surprise the members on the team as well. So I always enjoy those characters. I, I'm really excited to see him interact with other characters. Like, I feel like Shang Chi and Spider Man would have great chemistry. Yeah, he kind of he fits like he that. fits. Yeah, and I want him on the next roster. Like I want him on the Avengers Four roster. He needs to be there. Well, we can were you talking see him about. In, can you see him in Endgame though? In a fight like Endgame. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Or Infinity War. No, when they fitted him up, I was like, okay. Oh, okay. Because I wasn't impressed with him. It's funny because the third act was my biggest problem of the movie, but that's when he got a bit more interesting because yeah. he was doing some some cool things. And once they put on the costume. So he's not always fighting in Wranglers and a sports cap? No. <laughs> All <right. laughs> Although those were the best fights. <laughs> him on the bus was iconic. I could watch that every day for the rest of my life, that bus sequence. That was great. Yeah, he was that. I guess the smaller like hand to hand stuff was the the, the the parts I really liked about it. And I um, did the choreography look forced? No, it looks really great. There's this one sequence where um, it's a flashback where he's fighting the mom. They're not like going at it, but they're kind of like it's like a it's like a ballet of sorts, and it just fits so well. It's very well co- choreographed. Where it's like in that aspect, it's like. It was like a dance fight. 
and I thought that was very well done. And it fit that scene. In other parts where they are doing actual hand to hand, I'm gonna kill you fighting. I thought it looked very, it was very well done as well. Does the hand to hand compare to uh, Winter Soldier? No, it's Winter Soldier's better. It's a bit more creative. Winter Soldier's grittier, more, more like, yeah. you know, maybe more realistic. This is more a bit, a bit more stylized. But right. I think it, like, it just it worked in this movie. Yeah, there were uh, the scenarios in Winter Soldier were a bit more hectic, um, and like I said, I think the the way that they use Cap's ability for fighting with martial arts and the super strength. Obviously, Shang Chi doesn't have super strength, so you can't have him kicking people off of boats like Cap did, or breaking through fucking walls. Even when he's using the ten rings, he uses the ten rings, right? He does, and then the action gets a little bit not you know it's it's less interesting. Right. It's more uh, Tony Lung's character using the ten rings was a badass. Yeah. <laughs> Those scenes were were really good. We don't see him using much of it. Yeah. Uh, Shang Chi. But like Aaron said, it's very stylized. It's very, it's definitely very good. Nice. Uh, it's not like the best uh, martial arts movie that I've ever seen in terms of the choreography, but it holds up. It it's passed a my movie test. Too. It's not, not an indie. Yeah, and you feel th- out of Japan, what's important to me is that movie. you feel the violence, you feel the punches, especially when it's martial arts. That's why right. I love the Russo brothers because when like Black Widow shows up in Civil War and she kicks that soldier into a fucking tank. And you can hear the yeah. door crunch him. Like that's what I want. Yeah, you know, I want it to feel visceral. Right. Like I'm in the fight. And but I think Shang Chi did but, that. But that kind of fight seems like it's just completely fake and unbelievable. Black Widow's not kicking someone into a tank. No. You know what I mean? No. Did you see What If? Have you been watching What If? No. There's a scene when she goes crazy on some dudes in uh, one of the episodes of What If. And I was like, if this happened in live action, so many male fans would be crying oh yeah <laughs> Twitter would be going nuts I gotta watch that that's the animated on Disney Plus right yeah it's it's getting better yeah I wasn't I didn't like the f- like they were fine the first two but I'm kind of it's not like something where I'm like jumping every Wednesday to see it in the morning it's like I'll get to it when I get no, to yeah, it no yeah that's yeah. a like just binging all four was fun mm-hmm. um, but yeah chang chi we teased this a bit in the beginning has made $94 million domestically over the Labor Day weekend, which That's a lot, smashed dude. the record, which I think was only $30 million. So like I said, not a lot of major blockbusters come out over Labor Day weekend, but it's a good sign because other movies are now moving their release dates up. Uh, I think Venom, Let There Be Carnage, has moved up to October 1st. I know Aaron's thrilled about that. But I think that's <laughs> the first of that happening since the pandemic started, right? It's it's always movies being pushed back. It's encouraging. Right. Now it's movies being moved up. Um, and it, it beat expectations. Is it still hard to judge, though, because it's Marvel? And it has the crazy fan base? Well, Black Widow didn't really... Uh, I think Black Widow had time. a better window. It's not a Jordan Peele movie coming out and making... Fifty million? No, of course not. I think know? if Shang Chi didn't have the Marvel label in front of it, it doesn't make as much. Yeah. But like Aaron said, with Black Widow, I th- different time. But Black Widow also had the dual release, mm-hmm. more favorable window when it comes to theatrical releases. You mm-hmm. would think. But now with Shang Chi not having the premium access on Disney Plus, it's made back its budget. It's one of the smaller budgets for an origin movie in the MCU. Probably just one of their smaller budgets altogether for any of their movies. So it's it's poised to make a profit. If you stop giving people the option to watch it online. They're gonna go back to the movie theater to watch the, to watch these movies. Yeah, I think especially. I think it has to stop the online releases, especially like Marvel fans who don't want to miss any of them. I think. Yeah. Um, our theater was packed when we saw it opening night. Uh, it is a movie that I think lends well to like a theatrical experience because it does get there's some grand action sequences and you know it's always gonna be better with the sound and the big screen of the IMAX theater. So. I think it's definitely one that I would have been disappointed if I watched it at home instead, because I would have been—I still would have liked it, but I would have been like, "This would have been better on the big screen." So you know what took in another eight million this weekend? Free guy. <laughs> wow, <laughs> it's at two hundred and forty million worldwide. Let's go on a one hundred and twenty-five million dollar budget. Free guy and Shang Chi saving the movie theaters, dude. Does sh- that's a team of does Shang Chi push uh, Marvel forward, or is it just its own movie? To introduce no no it, pushes, it, it definitely yeah. pushes it forward nice it's definitely that's um, that's, inc- that, that's nice to know that they're not just like they're moving the story forward and not just like taking a break and that's actually a positive of the guys. movie where they move the overall story right. forward without focusing on that too much it was the end credit scene it's the first sign of the avengers existing still do you consider the right. end credit scene part of a movie yes yeah hmm. I think there are cases where it could be a throwaway, like an Ant Man, the Ant playing the drums. Mm-hmm. Whatever, that's stupid. It's not very consequential to the overall story. 
Does but that was Mangold's whole point, right? It's like the movie's finished when the credits roll. Don't add it. It's a gimmick if you added a, an extra credit scene. It's a scene. Yeah. <laughs> it, no one says there's no rules that say once the credits roll, the movie's finished that you can't have more scenes. Is there any mention of Kang or no. what went on with Loki? Is no. this before? No. Is this before or after Loki? I mean, it's so hard to say. You can't yeah. really tell. Can't no. tell. Yeah. They're saying that one moment when Kang can no longer see the future happens in episode eight of WandaVision. So I guess this is technically after oh. Kang can no longer see the future. I got to read up on this. This is, sounds like it's a Yeah, there's intricate. like three <laughs> concurrent events that they're saying that's the moment. That's what Vinny said too. Right. He was trying to explain it to me, but I couldn't follow him. So I think Shang-Chi is um, obviously after Endgame, right. after all that. So I'm. I, you think Kang appears in uh, Spider-Man? No. Too think, much going on in that I think movie. he'll be in Doctor Strange. Maybe an end credit, but... Right. Um, I yeah. think he definitely appears in Doctor Strange. Just going back to the box office, I think it's a good sign. I think we were talking about this today, about doing like... Yeah, 150 worldwide so far. I think you see this, and uh, I don't think they're going to because they did like push the simultaneous thing. Like That's what HBO Max does. Like You're going to get the same day access to the movies that are going to be in a big screen. So I think Dune's going to stay that way, but... In terms of, I guess, Disney properties who are have been flexible or have changed their mind when it comes to this, I think it's a good sign that they're going to continue to, just to do theatrical releases. And I guess it depends on the person, like, who this, like, if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think it's a good thing. Yeah, your point about HBO Max already coming out, Warner Brothers coming out, that's just their plan. So if they go back on it, a month before the movie is going to come out because we're closing in on it. It's almost a month away. Then that makes them look bad. And I think a lot of people, listen, just because a few people have decided they're going to watch it at home, that doesn't mean they can't go back on it. But there are definitely people that are going to be vocal about how upset they are. And people are still, listen, people have every right to be worried about going out, not wanting to catch the Delta variant, wanting to, you know, take precautions. You have every right to do that. But what Shang-Chi is showing us, what Fast 9 is showing us, what Free Guy is showing us, is that you are going to make more money when you don't mm. have a simultaneous release. And we don't have the numbers. We don't know how many subscribers they're bringing in. However, I think you still they realize... It. It's still tough to base it off that because of how much content on each on each uh, streaming service. You don't know what's bringing it in, what's not bringing it in. Right. Yeah, even if it is the most watched, does that still make sense for your streaming service? Yeah. Suicide Squad, most watched movie on HBO Max. Did you need that, though? Did you need to spend $200 million to get the most watched movie on HBO Max? Because I don't think Mortal Kombat was $200 million budget, but that's the most watched movie on HBO Max, still, number one. Wow. So maybe the, the shit movies <laughs> will be, or not the, the less expensive high art films will still be appearing on streaming services, but I can't imagine that we're going to see these tentpole blockbusters coming out with simultaneous releases. It just doesn't make sense monetarily. You make these movies for the theater. You really shouldn't limit yourself to... Like, you should make this movie's best potential with putting it into the theaters. Instead of having people watch it on TV. Right, I don't even think it's corporations trying to keep us safe. I think it's corporations trying to figure out what's going to be the best way to make money. Yeah. It's not like they're like, oh, Dune's going to come out yeah. on HBO Max because... We love those fans. Yes. We want right. it to be safe. Exactly. No, it's... But also... Maybe trying this to... will work. Maybe it won't work. Now we've already dug ourselves too deep. We have to do it. But Which, sure, like, like, I, don't, like, I, I honestly like that's what corporations do. That's like the business. That's smart business. Because if, if they did do that and it hurt them financially, then guess what? That's going to affect their future movies. <laughs> or... They're trying to like be preventative because of how much backlash social media has. Where if let's say they let their movie out and something comes out that this movie's release or like this theater was a super spreader, and now you have all this backlash on your company, right? That but, you don't need when you can just put it on TV. Just trying to play the game. Yeah, I, I think when it comes down to it, like obviously it's a weird time, and I respect like people who want to like who don't want to go to the theater and still want to be safe. And like, obviously for them not being able to see certain movies because of that, like, it's you know, on them. it's an, no, but it's <laughs> technically it is. Yeah. I but mean, it's on the situation as well. So it's like, it's, it's a hard thing, but I always think like 
certain movies and like are just built for the big big screen and i think that it's me personally it's just a, a, the preferred medium to like watch something especially like a shang chi or a dune or the eternals coming out like those big action blockbusters you want to be in a big screen with the popcorn and all that yeah. so like if, if dune was just strictly coming out like if theaters were still closed and it was just coming out on HBO, like I would not be happy about that. I would rather it wait, be delayed until it yeah. was ready to come out. All right, let's move on to the next story here because we're closing in. Oh, Hopefully, what? we can get to fan questions. We're closing in on like an hour. <laughs> we're like thirty minutes left, so yeah. we're like halfway through. Not closing in, but we're halfway through. Next story, Tiff. We'll just talk about this briefly. We're going to Tiff this week. Look at that. Toronto Film Festival is starting Thursday. Me and Aaron will be there. Teddy will not. I'm going to be solo potting You're on You're banned from Canada, Thursday. right? <laughs> yeah, I got extradited. Oh, uh, extradited? You were Canadian? Back to the U.S. Okay. What? I can't go into Canada. Okay, right, right, right. But what were you wanted for in Don't the worry U.S.? Don't worry about it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thursday, man. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. We reserved our seats today. You got up to, for press, you got up to 12 tickets, and then it's kind of survival of the fittest for the rest of them. What do you mean get... I've been just looking mean? in my Google, my Apple wallet. You can all day. reserve up to twelve movies, but for the other ones, it's going to be oh, day of twelve tickets total. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. Meant like you can bring twelve people. Oh no, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no! You can only just bring yourself. Look how cool that! Like, just look at that. Just, there it is. Yeah, it's pretty dope. Nice QR code. Love a QR code. Oh, a good, a good two percent phone battery. Walking <laughs> in, I, oh, I fucking hope <laughs> <laughs> phone stops working. <laughs> I might have to go. I might bring a porty because we're gonna be out and about all day. Yeah, yeah, you should bring a porty. I don't have a porty. I can buy one. Let's go buy a porty. Or we'll just be in the moment, not use your phone. <laughs> well, I'm gonna need it for my tickets. No, the phone actually will probably stay on all day. Yeah, we're not gonna be on it that much. We're gonna be sitting at movies. Yeah, <sighs> that sounds awful. What? Dude, we can watch up to <laughs> like some days we're gonna be watching like five movies in a day. Oh my god, you wouldn't be able to do that, right? <laughs> no, the first the first one we're going to to kick off everything. I got trouble watching three one. hours long. Yeah, you hear this Thursday, twelve o'clock. Noon, three hour movie. What is it? To kick it off. Uh, drive My Car, a Japanese movie. <laughs> no, <laughs> Not even don't. in English. Yeah, I'm out. <laughs> I wouldn't even want to be there, to be honest with you. I would go there just to hang out in Toronto. <laughs> right, yeah, you can have a good time. But well, I was telling him, it's like, I, it sucks because we're, <laughs> <only Dune. laughs> we're not going to be able to like, actually experience the city at all or that off, like that much. But yeah, that's why you guys do it, right? Yeah, it's all it's work, right? You're going to review to all the movies you watch? I think, well. Definitely, if you want to see my reactions, this is me talking to the listeners. No. <laughs> uh, follow my letterbox because that's where I'll be updating every movie I see. I'm going to write a little review. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about them all. I think maybe, obviously, Dune got to, we'll get a separate one. Right, yeah. We're seeing Dune on Saturday noon. So, I mean, be on the lookout if you care about that for our reactions around like 2.30 p.m. Wait, you're going to review Dune? We're not going to review we get it. Back. But, yeah, when we get back. When does Dune come out over here? October 22nd. <laughs> Ted's like it's October right <laughs> we're close it's spooky season yeah we might record like a quick hits right or even right after Dune like what are our thoughts immediate thoughts after Dune it's so good tragic that Teddy couldn't watch it. Uh, other movies that we were looking forward to you know like we, we talked about a lot of them on the podcast with Matt so Power of the Dog Titan Eternals, Doctor Strange, <laughs> yeah, Doctor Godfather Strange. Four, <laughs> with Leo. <laughs> so that should be a fun trip. And like I said, if you're interested in TIFF and, and some of these movies that are coming out, make sure you follow us on social media. Both Soup, Nerd yeah. Soup, Monkey. We'll be tweeting our thoughts. Uh, we may put at TIFF and our usernames. Uh, no, I'm not going to be one of those guys. Right. It's just how people going to know that you're at TIFF. Yeah, embrace it. So no, it's for the people that are there. there. You're there for a reason, man. Uh, but like. Yeah, I think the biggest ones obviously is doing Last Night in Soho, Dear Evan Hansen. Last yeah. Night in Soho looks like I'm pissed you guys have seen that. Power too. of the Dog is, uh, has a lot of Oscar buzz around it. So They added a late, um, not a late screening, but a, a surprise. game time decision screening for Last Night in Soho. Because initially they were scheduled, it was scheduled at the same time as Dune. Oh, well. And then they added one for Friday at so 9. Like, yeah, definitely excited to see that. Say that again? The Saints in Newark in there? <laughs> I wish. That'd be sick. Uh, that's coming out in October, right? Yeah. I'm surprised that didn't air at any festivals. Hmm. I'm going to get on that end succession. i hit the HBO people up. Goddamn. They better hook us up. <laughs> All right, let's move to the next story here. We have TIFF. We're going. We're excited. Follow us. Uh, a bit of a sad story here. Michael Kenneth Williams. This was news that we all got yesterday. 
uh, the whole world got yesterday. Tragic. Tragically passed away at 54 years old. An actor who has become iconic because of his roles on HBO. Of course, Omar in The Wire, one of the most iconic roles of all time. Uh, his work on Boardwalk Empire, which I never watched that show, but knowing that he's in it, I had no idea that he was actually in yeah. it. I saw a lot of scenes. He's like in every HBO show. Yeah. Like he got. He was making that HBO money. In. They got right. him, and he's like, yeah, we're just going to keep you around because you're just great <laughs> and everything. I often tell the story of Assassin's Creed being my worst in theater experience for a movie. However, when Michael Kenneth Williams popped up for five minutes, it was a blast because I got so excited. I was like, Michael Kenneth Williams. Yeah. He's amazing and everything he's in. And as bad as that fucking movie was, he was the one bright spot. Uh, and you know what? As legendary and as iconic as he is, it feels like he was very underused. That oh, I very. always wanted not... to see him in more stuff. Yeah. I always wanted to see him working with the best actors. And he has that typecast commercial, right? And it's kind of yeah. heartbreaking now that he's that he's no longer here. I mean, definitely, like, when you talk about television, like, he was just in, like, Lovecraft Country earlier right, last yes. year, too. So, like, when you talk about, like, just strictly television actors, like, he's got to be at the top of the list. There's so many great performances and so many great roles. Uh, yeah, but like you said, always supporting, like, I don't know if you ever really gotten the opportunity to like actually um, break out and lead a lead a project or right, a, a great drama, or a great film. Like Small he's been film. in like Twelve Years a Slave, very critically acclaimed, but like he, inherent vice yeah. supporting role. So it's like probably one of the better like just supporting actors in of all time. But yeah, like you said, like for someone of his talent to never really like break out and have that like defining lead role I think that's just uh and it sucks now he's always like now it's like now you look back and talk about how good he is rather than when he's alive and uh not getting those opportunities like it's kind of disappointing and but yeah when you talk about like even community just like him being like in a show like that a comedy show I had no fantastic. idea he's in that yeah, I he's saw in some community. of the screenshots he's um he's one of like he's a professor he's, pre- he's perfect <laughs> um Oh, his range. I think that was the most frustrating part for him, too, when he has that commercial talking about being typecast. Incredible range, but they were always giving him the same role, the same role. That's why I always want to... And now I almost feel bad for not talking about him more on the pod because he's always been one of my favorites. Like, his performance in The Night Of. Incredible. And it's obviously a similar character to characters he's already played, but he's just so he's good, so good at it, everything you give him. And, of course, the big one, Omar. I mean, did you have you ever seen the Wire, Ted? I just started watching it because okay. I I uh, I fell asleep watching Date Night uh, Dateline, and that came up and suggested, and I couldn't fall asleep, so I said fucking started it, and I went like seven or eight episodes in. Oh man, so you're <laughs> almost done with season one? Yeah, it's fucking good, bro. Yeah, and <laughs> I always heard how good and critically acclaimed this show was, but it's really good. <laughs> I kind of want to rewatch it now. You should. Yeah, yeah. I, I- watched like most of like. But my roommate in college and I were watching at the same time, but he was a, a dick, and like I would just come back into the room at the class, and he would just be on like three episodes later. Oh, and that's he, annoying. And Elena sh- does that shit to and me. And I'd be like, "Well, like I, I got stuff to do. It's my room, <laughs> so now I'm just like watching this episode now that I really don't know. So it kind of got like now you're three episodes further fudged up for me, but." They were sharing all the scenes on social media. Omar's coming. Omar's coming. Yeah. I mean, what type of character? What <laughs> other character gets that reaction from the people in his own in his own fictional world? No, one of the more iconic t- television characters <laughs> of all time, especially like the fucking shotgun, the coat. Especially that era of television where that was really like one of the, you know, when we talk about like where television is today, like you can go far back to like Twin Peaks or whatever, and to say like how that was like maybe the predece- predecessor to like modern television but like not really because there was just a long time in between that and then you had stuff like Oz and those early HBO shows and eventually The Wire and Sopranos like for me that's when I that's kind of like the era of when I think of like great television has arrived and it, it's like ever since then it has just been consistent consistent great television and like kind of building off of those shows so Right, I think uh, like Twin Peaks is you can do this on television, and the Wire and Sopranos We're not is do like it yet. right. We can do this consistently. Mm-hmm. This doesn't have to be something you do for a season and then cancel it. You can have real success here. And the Wire is a show that's often remembered as a show that wasn't as acclaimed. It was acclaimed. No, but, but it, wasn't it wasn't as popular, popular as it yeah. should have been. There's that 
great bit in Parks and Rec where they go to the alternate history mm-hmm. museum, and it's The Wire sweeps the Emmys again. <laughs> Fifth straight year, winning Best Drama. Um, right, that's a show where I feel like The Sopranos, just because like I feel like the subject matter and like the gangster films are just so iconic and like in our... I don't know, just in our like culture as American movie audiences, like it was such an easier transition than this like gritty the world that The Wire portrays. And I think that once like the binging, probably around like this when I was a colleague, early 2010s, like when that became a thing where people were always trying to find the new shows, new shows, what's the next show I got to watch? Yeah. And you started looking backwards and like, oh yeah, The Wire. Like this is has all these great reviews, and I've heard how good it is. Not maybe I'll check this out now. And I feel like streaming gave that show like just that extra life that we've seen with so many other shows. Definitely. Well, before streaming, you had to buy box sets to watch it. You right. buy a box set of The Wire. But in but, his character I mean, in The it's Wire, it's worthy of it. But to yeah, a new watcher, like you're not going to do that. You talked about how you know unique to the time The Wire was, how ahead of its time it was. His character is the same, kind of really captures what the show was, just through one character. So many layers and the ability for him to to portray all those different layers of Omar. That's why it became so iconic, because even though he was this very dangerous and intimidating hitman, he had a sensitive side. He had his boyfriend. He had the people that he would confide in, his mother. Um, He had his own set of, of, of codes and rules that he would abide by. So he was a very complex stick up man. I don't think there's an actor alive that could have played Omar Little better than Michael Kenneth Williams. Mm-hmm. And to the not to the detriment of his career, but you know, he was frustrated by being typecast by only being associated not only but being associated so much with that character. But that's what happens when you're a genius, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you do it so well. Right. Yeah. When you when you have an opportunity to really show off and everybody just can't get enough of it. Yeah, and it's such like from Obviously, I never met him, but, like, just from interviews and interactions with, like, and the way people talk about him, he just seemed just like a generally good person and someone who deeply cared about his work. Yes. Yeah. I didn't know the social media presence was, like, how much he was going to have an impact on everyone is posting about this guy. He's one of those guys you don't realize how how many people that he's made an impact on. So, he's, like, he's talk about, like... Fat Joe put a video up of him. Yeah. Yeah. But those, like, iconic roles and those iconic shows, like, you don't really, you might not realize it, like, when you think Boardwalk Empire, you might think, yeah, that's uh, Steve Buscemi, but, like, when you realize, like, oh, like, some of your other, like, he's just, no matter, like, what error, like, you've watched television in, like, there's a great chance that he played a crucial role in, like, one of the uh, the shows that you enjoyed. And Hey, like, he's in The Sopranos <laughs> for one episode. Yeah. When uh, I forget what's the character's name when he's he's hiding away because he's about to be taken out. I think it's April, Jackie's son. Oh, remember when he's hiding yeah, away? And he's yeah. playing chess against his daughter. <laughs> oh my God, are you yeah, serious? That's Michael Kenneth Williams. Yeah, Michael Kenneth Williams is the daughter's father. Wow. Right. So it was like Omar escaped to the Sopranos. What the hell? That's crazy. It's a crossover. But yeah, no, I mean, fifty-four years old man, too young. He had maybe 30, maybe even 40 more years of acting in him. And sometimes you see a, a lot with these actors that they don't break out as leading men and sometimes until they're in their late 40s or their 50s. Right. Look at Brian Cranston, right? It wasn't until he was 52 years old that he became a He was a star. fucking dad on a sitcom. <laughs> exactly. Are you kidding me? Yeah. So there was potential there for him to, to find some more great roles, to give us more iconic performances. And it's a tragedy, man. But he is someone who will be immortalized through the work he did on screen uh, and we will always continue to talk about him on this podcast because he's he's truly one of the goats uh, let's move on to the next story here we have our first look t- speaking about goats Neo from the Matrix <laughs> he's back first look at the Matrix 4 first images it was uh, like a teaser trailer with split second images of things happening in the world of the Matrix I have no idea what this movie is going to be However, that final shot of Neo walking through a crowd, camera to his back, long hair, get the shot of him looking at him, he's he's cut up. It looks I'm, dope. I'm ready for a gritty Neo. Neo. It yeah. looks fucking dope. It does. I can't w- eh. No, I can't I can't wait to rewatch the Matrixes. I didn't the first realize two are still good. I didn't realize how good the cinematography was in those movies. Like now that like you look back, at least myself because I was never into movies like that, where like you look back and actually just like watch the movie. It looks fucking insane. Yeah, and what's great about these images is that it feels like that old movie, but it has been updated. Yeah. 
similar to Blade Runner 2049, same universe, higher resolution. Blade Runner's on Netflix now, I saw. What? Yeah. 2049? Not a regular one. Hopefully it doesn't have that narration. Yeah, I was actually wondering what cut it was. <laughs> I just saw it quickly. I'm like, it was like 10 o'clock. I'm like, ah, I'm not going to get the Blade Runner right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a 10 o'clock movie. I thought about it. That's a 7.15 movie. Yeah. I I thought about it. but um, I watched Uncat Gems the other day at 10 a.m. 10 p.m. Really? That's yeah. a terrible movie. I know, but I, I, I couldn't stop watching. <laughs> I always like... What a movie. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, like, I am excited to revisit this world because it is such a... I just remember those days, man. Matrix took over the, the world. Oh, yeah, dude. Just the impact, the references. I'm sure, like, if it was came out today, like, just the memes that would have came from that or, like, the cultural impact would have been would have had if like social media was around oh yeah it kind of had that feel like where it was something that everyone knew about or talked about during those th- th- during those years stole the thunder yeah, everyone away from if you Star just Wars. do a slow motion bend like everyone got that reference oh like, yeah that's... this movie was ahead of its time we talk about cgi at least you look back at it right now and watch it it still holds up it still holds up the world doesn't looks look so out good. of place no no not at all and Agent the premise Smith kinda... that doctor strange before he did <laughs> <laughs> what's funny is that um you know, the technology, it's supposed to be the future, but they're all still in offices from the 90s. Yeah, they're I know. using cubicles. phones with cords, yeah, cubicles. So I wonder if they'll keep it like an analog society like Blade Runner 2049 did. You know, it's obviously the future. Tech is upgraded, but it's still all analog. It's, well, it's, it's Nothing's cr- digital. I like that. Like Star Wars, Yeah, they went back to that with, I think, the sequel trilogy where they kept it pretty... Uh, yeah, you got to bang on things for it yeah. to work. Um, in the prequels, it's just like it's the technology we're living with, <laughs> <laughs> and I can pull out an iPhone. <laughs> um, yeah, I wonder what because well, you can make the argument that so much time has passed in our world and that world, so it could just update with the times. But if they kind of keep right, it right. that uh, futuristic retro vibe, I think that would be just aesthetically. I think that's like a nice aesthetic. The way that it ended. Because it looks like we're getting back into the simulation world. The Matrix, right? That's what it is. Yeah. The Matrix was destroyed. They won. So maybe they didn't win? Maybe that was just a smaller Matrix inside of a bigger Matrix? The Super Matrix? I I wouldn't like that idea. Because the subtitle is Resurrections. Um, Right. Maybe the Matrix just came back. Can it come back? Can the Matrix come back? I feel like the Matrix could come back, yeah. You just got to plug it back in, right? Yeah. That's all they did. They just unplugged it. Maybe that's why it wasn't working so well. <laughs> they needed a quick little unplug, plug back yeah, in. Yeah, plug back in. Now it's they a super matrix. It. Right, yeah. yeah they like, didn't take the disc out and blow on it and yeah. put it back in. <laughs> <laughs> that's Agent Smith. He just realizes they just needed to reboot it. <laughs> like, oh, wait. Nope, we're still here. There hasn't been any word on Hugo Weaving coming back, right? I don't know if he's confirmed. No. He's got to come back. You got to bring him back and de-age him. Such an iconic villain. So many iconic things came out of this movie, man. What's the last thing Hugo Weaving's went? I mean... He wasn't in Endgame. Uh, he was in Hacksaw Ridge. Yes, he was the father. He's very. He's a dick in the father too. <laughs> he's always a dick in every role he plays. He's I guess. very good at playing a dick. Talk oh, about he's... typecast. I want nice guy. <laughs> I want Hugo Weaving or Michael Shannon to star in like a. The nice guys too. Yeah, but they're just like <laughs> they're, they're nice people. Right. It's like when Christoph Waltz was the Nazi. But everyone thinks they're dicks. Right. That's a movie right there. That's, isn't this why you bought the screenwriting software? Yeah. <laughs> why are you sitting here? <laughs> Last movie he was in was Hearts and Bones. Ah, yes, of course. And then Mortal Engines he was in as well. Oof. That wasn't that bad of a movie. This guy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's move on to the last story here, and then we'll wrap things up. Maybe we'll take a few fan questions. I think we're all excited for The Matrix. Yeah. Another movie that we would have been excited for if it was actually happening, The Russo Brothers returning to the MCU. Hold your horses. Apparently that was going to happen, but now they're not coming back, or they're at an impasse because of the Scarlett Johansson lawsuit. So that was an interesting story that broke over the weekend, that they were in talks to return. In what capacity, Avengers? So If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? I feel like for them, they would want... I don't know. I don't know them. but I feel like Do something smaller now, yes, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Like Moon Knight. Like, let us direct all episodes of Moon Knight or something like that. Oh, Obviously, sick. Moon Knight's already happening, but street-level hero. 
Hmm? Maybe Daredevil. Daredevil. Shang-Chi. Right, right, right. <laughs> I would love a Russo Brothers Daredevil movie. Would you Imagine see the action that, in that? The Spider-Man, the IMAX trailer with a bigger aspect ratio revealed that that guy was not Matt Murdock. Yeah, upsetting. Yeah, but um, I hope he's in it, man. Maybe that was the prosecuting lawyer. <laughs> that's the DA. Yeah, that's the DA. <laughs> um, but no, this I didn't, is an I didn't interesting story. This. I mean, the Russo when, Brothers directors obviously form relationships with their actors. I think oh, so it, their team scored Joe. Yes, that would be too. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's not only that their team scored Joe, but their team. You Get know, your bag. if we do this, how yeah. is how is the money going to be distributed? Get here? your bag. Right? Are we going to sign up for one thing and then you guys release it on Nickelodeon? No, I think that's like it's something where like the coach and the players. It's usually them, and then there's ownership, right? Like in sports, so I feel right. like that applies to maybe the film game as well. It's like directors and actors. It's there. Then, then you have the studio, right? Who are the owners? Yes. I was kind of hoping. I didn't read the article, but when I read the topic, I was kind of hoping that it was the Russo brothers stepping down and not taking another role, another uh, directing role. Ever? Interesting, because it would have been nice knowing that, thinking that maybe it's like we'll let someone else eat, and at least Marvel maybe. I want them to break apart. Do your own thing. See who's the real. Yeah. Who's the real winner? Sometimes you need two heads. When but it's talking like about if, that with Macbeth. It's like let's see what you got, Joel. Right. I guess it, you can't have you can't have the cake and eat it too because we say how good Marvel is because they got guys like the Russo brothers who are so good at making movies and what their ideas are where it's like if maybe they let someone else do it they don't make a good movie and then we complain about how bad a Marvel movie is. But who would be like next in line? But it's also nice seeing new directors come up and making a movie. In, in terms Marvel. of characters or directors? Yeah, to do the next big team up. X Men. Would it be no? But like I'm saying, like would it be a Taika? Would it be a James Gunn? Or oh, would it just oh, right, be right, right. Like no, I don't think there is a next in line. I don't think there is. That those things kind of happen naturally. Yeah. The Russo brothers had done so well. With Civil War became its own monster of a movie. I don't think they really signed up for that. I think the idea to bring in Iron Man it just all kind of culminated. Uh, it all kind of just came into being an Avengers 2.5 or whatever it is. Um, it really is an Avengers movie. It's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> culminated <laughs> <laughs> um, so it doesn't feel like there's that like Taika came back because they're gonna let him make Taika movies it's almost like he, he wants to do it like so that. well yeah. right right he wants to do his own thing James Gunn seemed to maybe be the next guy but it looks like he's just not necessarily been downgraded but before that whole cancellation he was gonna be like the cosmic guy he was gonna be like Feige's cosmic counterpart those were the rumors yeah we haven't heard anything about that in years. So it looks like he's coming back for three. Maybe if three does incredibly well at the box office, coming off a of Suicide Squad, maybe it's James Gunn. Yeah, um, but those guys like doing their own thing, though. And like right, you can't make movies. an Avengers movie a James Gunn movie. Right, right. You can make the Guardians a James Gunn movie, but... An Avengers movie is going to be a big studio, big blockbuster. And those guys hit certain beats, I feel like. And maybe those guys wouldn't want to hit hit the ones that the studio wants to hit or hit it the way that they want to hit it. I obviously don't know anything, but I think the Russo brothers were in talks for X-Men. I think that's... Oh. Now that it's Isn't there one Fantastic Four? I heard that, that they were very interested in that. Mm, yeah, I think I remember reading that too. I yeah. wouldn't hate that either. But I think it's going to be... That's a good way to usher in those characters that people are familiar with but you get a director who or directors who really know how to handle those team up movies well I was thinking about Fantastic Four like just how popular they are I've always known they've been as as comics they've been super popular right but like general audience wise it's like they're pretty iconic. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I guess People just know them. They it's just easy know. to remember. Well they had a television show and I think really what benefited them is even though those movies aren't considered to be great i feel like they were good enough at that time when they came in especially being in that like post like that superhero movies are still relatively new and a lot of the stuff you've seen on screen was like very like oh a man turned into flames right what kind of witchcraft is this they were successful for the time yes and i think that left like a pretty no like substantial like impact on a lot of people where they are like People just know the Fantastic Four. Well, More? they are the first team, right? Yeah. 
I'm pretty sure that was the first. But like, game how many general Justice people came just them. know like comics like that? Right. No. Yeah. It is weird. Everyone knows the thing. Right. They know the Human Torch. They know that the woman becomes invisible. Uh, Mr. Fantastic stretching his arms. No, they are super iconic. Without it, it, it's similar to uh, before Wonder Woman came out. Right. Isn't that the first comic with Spider Man? Fantastic Four. It might be. Or like, or Maybe these were isn't more that like one like, of the first comics. I guess comics were a lot like more generally because I wasn't alive during that time. But like, it's like you got the sense that it was a very niche, like kind of like, oh, only like the nerds read comics. But everyone knew knows Wonder Woman or Superman or Batman even before movies and television. Like Golden Age, Silver Age, Bronze yeah. Age. They obviously got less popular as time went on, but some of them stuck around. Coming into Avengers, the like the four biggest Marvel heroes coming into Avengers were Spider Man, Wolverine. <laughs> Professor X and probably Magneto four characters Disney didn't even have rights to so times have changed since 28 uh, 2008 and then again in 2012 yeah Iron Man was established but 2012 made him one of the you, know, you put him on the Mount Rushmore now bro like, when that Tobey Maguire Spider-Man came out it fucking lit the world on fire I know dude yeah seriously it, it, as much of a hit as Fantastic Four was, when you make good versions of those types of movies, they become even bigger. Uh, so iconic. All right, you guys want to go to fan questions? I was watching quick? a scene yesterday yeah. when Spider-Man gets his power, like he realized he has his powers. I actually got to go. It's a good scene. No, dip out. You sure? Yeah, you dip it for fan questions. We got some anime ones. All right. But kid got cocky, though. Like he, I got to pick up the photos. Did a wall ran down, run down the stairs. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Sorry, you got cool powers now. Someone's got to clean those walls. <laughs> I love Ted waiting for you to finish your point. Yeah, I didn't want to leave. I uh, feel bad. I got to go. All right, bye, guys. Bye, Ted. I got to pick up the photos from the wedding. Oh, wow. Just ready. doesn't stop with your wedding, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> See you later. See you, man. Uh, I'll drop off the... I'll text you. Okay. I'll text you, too. It's actually your wedding last week. It was a fun one. What a good time. I could care less. That's for the fan to decide. Yay! People, you call up to the show, you better be ready. That's what you're supposed to do. Sitting there arguing and trying to spell your name and all of this other stuff. It's not just show, it's my show. I'm giving you the, the opportunity to speak your mind. Don't call up here unless you got something to say. All right, first question here. I did like your tweet about wedding should be a five-hour cocktail hour. It's true. You should have came to my sister's wedding. That's what they did. That's what I'm going to do. They had a nice little cigar bar up top, yeah. cigar roller. Could have been puffing. All right, this question here from my T Nick. We'll just take a few. Do you think Shigaraki gets any sort of redemption by the end of the series? I think what they're doing now is kind of genius, pitting villains against villains. Yeah. I think this is all about just getting a better understanding of what led Shigaraki to become a villain and all of the League of Villains characters. It's showing us the the problems with superhero society and how the cracks have led to these individuals becoming villains. I think it's easier for a character maybe like twice to get like a... Redemption. Even Toga. Yeah. Eh, she's kind of a psychopath. <laughs> the, her episode was really good, right? Yeah. The last but, episode was great, but too. Like, but, like, she yeah, was, yeah. like, it's like, yeah, you got backstory, but it's, like, she straight up confirms, like, oh, yeah, no, I am a psychopath. Yeah, that is true. So right, it wasn't, right, right, like, right. oh, it's, like, oh, we got more understanding. It's, like, oh, but, like, she likes this. Yeah, and twice it's, like, he's, he overcame his mental illness, mm -hmm. but he's still a villain <laughs> so it was an all it was a he even but, mentions it in the no i i think yeah. you're right that twice could get more redemption but the way that they're um i i think it's genius that they're all talking about how twice is having his hero moment but he's still a villain mm -hmm. you know he's like i feel like a hero it's like polka dot man yes yeah very similar to that uh, but shigaraki no i think what he's going to have the he's going to grow on the fan base he's going to continue to grow continue to grow we're never going to root for him over deku some sickos might but when they do have that inevitable f confrontation, Deku versus Shigaraki, it's going to be hard to watch Deku defeat this man. Or maybe he doesn't. Um, but they're on the same trajectory. They're leveling up at this moment. So no, I don't think there's any redemption. I think there's confrontation, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, this question here from Ali underscore B, because Dune is part one, will Aaron read after the sequel? Ooh, yeah, that's what I, that's what I would do. You would still wait for part two? And no, 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 no. If I, oh, okay. yeah, that's what I did. Like with Game of Thrones and stuff. Like I've watched, got to where I caught up, and I'm like, I love this. I want more, and I read the books. I think a lot of people are going to do that. Yeah, 
I hear that's like the main criticism. We didn't really talk about the reviews, but mostly positive, 86% on Rotten Tomatoes as of now. Um, but one of the criticisms is that it very much feels like a part one. Right. Which, yeah, because it, it is a part one. Yeah, I, I read one review that, and this was a positive review, that it builds up to a third act that never happens. Um, so it edges it, you a little. What do you say? It edges you a little. Right. Uh, and based on the trailers, it looks like we are going to... The action set pieces may come more at the beginning of the third act, whereas the third act does end just kind of a, not that abruptly. That is hard to do. We talked about this too today, like with Lord of the Rings, just the first three movies being so perfect as individual films. With three complete acts, that was actually a part of one of the acts when you consider them all three. <laughs> yeah, no, it's incredible. Yeah. And I, I think there's not a clean break in the story of Doom because it is the one novel. So it's it's not like you have something to go off of where, okay, this journey is ending and then the next journey is starting. So that's a bold decision. I, I think it was... We'll right see if one. it's proven to be yeah. right. I think artistically it was, and hopefully the movie does well It could well be a case like once the second one comes out, you just lose that criticism of one because it's just a complete movie. Right. Uh, this question here from Oakley B. You can only watch five director's movies for the rest of your life. Who are you picking? Rest of my life? Right. So I'm going to go young versus right? yeah, Scorsese. I was like, how many Scorsese's am I getting? I'm picking Scorsese. How many you get? You're not going to get? No, all of them. Oh, you can keep watching. You can only watch their filmography. Okay, I was thinking of more of like from now on. No, Scorsese, Miyazaki, Lynch. You'd I, go Lynch? I, he is like one of my favorites, but. He's only got like seven. He doesn't have a, like, if I can only watch those movies, I want someone with a deep catalog. Right, but with Lynch movies, you find something new every time. But Imagine it, just, the it only... gives you more questions. Right, yeah, and eventually you go crazy. You're right. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Yeah, I'm throwing Lynch in there. Miyazaki, Lynch, Scorsese, because he's got so many. That sounds like Spielberg, like even though he like he has some like really favorite movies, but like he just has a ton of movies. Different genres that span across. Yeah, Spielberg and then I'll go Kurosawa. Yeah. Go Kurosawa's new. got a lot. I'm trying to think like but I would have to go like maybe um, like like Villeneuve would have been in Judd my Apatow, slot. like just because, <laughs> like I'm just thinking like of movies that like different genres because then I need I need comedies too. I'm not gonna just watch fucking genres or fucking s- those movies. That's a good point. Yeah. So you're not thinking of this like with a with a logical brain here. Palette cleanser movies. All right, so I'll swap out Scorsese for Michael Bay. No, keep Scorsese in there. I'll swap. Maybe out you sc- want a Bay though every now and then. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You got to switch it up. No, I can just make myself laugh. I don't need comedies. I'm going to stick with my five. Okay. All right, we'll take... Did you pick? Um, I'm still, like... I'm going more into it than you are. Yeah, I just didn't pick five of my favorite directors. I'm trying (laughs) to, like, actually figure something out here. I'm very easily entertained. All right, one last question here. Who are we taking? Who are we taking? But I'd have to to pick Terrence. Like, even though I, I... It's not that many movies. I would just have to pick Tarantino. Just the amount of sheer movies that... He has that are my favorites that I rewatch a lot. And like with Scorsese, too, you have to do something like that. That's tough. That's actually a really good question, and I hate it. Yeah, I mean, Scor- Scorsese, he's got some comedies. My temptation of Christ is a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> and silence. <laughs> uh, this question here from Tiana. Tania sucks. Last question. Does seeing an overused popular actor affect how you view their character in a movie? What's funny is like I read a review about this this criticism for Dune. One of the reviews was an- another positive review, but that the movie was miscast. Really? And that the castings were a bit of a distraction at times for them. And I wonder if Dune has like an A-list film Twitter cast. But the casual fan, like they'll recognize Brolin and Oscar Isaac. Maybe. I don't know. They're not, but Oscar Isaac and Brolin aren't A-listers. Even like They're Chalamet B-listers. and like, I don't know if my mom knows Chalamet or right. Karen down the street is don't know who Timothy no. Chalamet no. is. He's on his way to becoming an A-lister. Yeah. I don't think he is one yet. Because what like, when you think about like what movies has he been in that has been super popular? Yeah, none. It's just all acclaim. With, yeah, good acclaim and he's a terrific actor. But yeah, in terms of box office, none. He's popular to us and like, uh, like the young people. Yeah, the biggest star. The young people love that to me. See, <laughs> pound for pound, biggest star in the movie is Zendaya. 
Um, and you even, think? Yeah, but she younger, she's not the main character with younger audiences, right? But even her, she's like I feel like a lot with shout like she's definitely popular with people who like watch a lot of movies and with the younger audience because of like just uh quote unquote like stand culture and kind of so much more than just an actress. Like she's just a kind of a presence for a lot of younger people. But I think when you think of general audience as an older, I don't know, maybe maybe it is like someone like Josh Brolin or Jason Momoa too. He's just I feel like he's Yeah, maybe. Like it's hard to gauge or separate like our circles from like general circles. So that's it is like people always talk about Star Wars is a movie where you don't want to cast popular actors in it because you don't want to take away from being absorbed into the world of Star Wars. So if you cast the fucking rock as a Jedi, that'd be ridiculous. I think there are a lot of movies where you can't cast someone like the rock because he's just the rock. Mm. Um, I don't think anyone is like that. What do you mean? No, but even if you got, like, Tom Hanks in Star Wars, that would be distracting. Okay. You know, it's just, like, Tom Hanks in Star Wars. Or Will Smith. Like, um, I can't... None are coming to my head, but I think about this often, that there are examples out there, but, like I said, none are coming to my head, of an actor being just too famous for the role. Margot Robbie, Whiskey, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. That's <laughs> all we can... Seriously, we were like, why is Margot Robbie in this? She's so... At the time, she was coming off of Wolf of Wall Street. And it was distracting for the movie because you have this beautiful starlet in the Afghanistan acting as a journalist. This is not realistic. Too famous. Get out of here. No. Or like if you got um, like prime Jackie so Matt Chan. Matt Damon in Avatar. If he took that role, or would you just be like, oh, it's just Matt Damon in Avatar? I think that works though. I think Matt Damon works for Avatar. I don't think it becomes distracting. Like, Leo in Avatar would have been obnoxious, <laughs> right? Like, why the fuck is Leo in Avatar? But I don't think any... Maybe. Maybe they are. Maybe I'm just, like... Or Tom Cruise? Like, Tom Cruise as Iron Man, I think, would have been a perfect example of that. Too famous. You're already too famous. You're I don't not, think that you're translates to the superhero world, either. Because a lot of... Say that again? Do you think that translates to the superhero realm? Like, those movies? Like, Ben Affleck as Batman? Ben Affleck. I think that was the worry. He ended up nailing it, but I think that was some of the worry with Ben Affleck as Batman. Like, why are you casting this oddly famous guy as, as Batman? But it turned out to work. That is interesting. Brad uh, Pitt as Batman would be weird. You just want to fit the character. Or like if they got like Jackie Chan in his prime to do Shang-Chi. That actually might work. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, this is... Uh, Maybe it's a, it's maybe it's a case where it's just so such a deep cast, but like when you when you look at a cast from like um, Don't Look Up, the new Adam McKay movie, or any, any Adam McKay movie really, with these stat casts, I never like I'm never like oh that's Ryan Gosling, that's Christian Bale, that's you know. I think it's more for blockbusters. Mm. I think it's it's harder to like the A lister has to be perfectly casted in a blockbuster. And surrounded can by be strictly distracted. character actors. Right. <laughs> like, oh, I know that person. He's really good in a lot of things, but Snap what's his name? Person. What's right. his name? Yeah. Who's that from the from the thing? From the yeah. Snap finger famous, as Kevin Hart likes to say. Yeah, we'll just have to see. I don't think that's going to be too much of a distraction. Yeah, we're going to see it on Saturday. Look at that. Hmm. Nerd 2 Podcast, over. We'll be back next week. I think that is a case, though, of us. I think there is something to be said about, like, how we view maybe certain actors versus the general like public. Definitely, we we keep talking about how stacked the cast is, but for a lot of these people, if, if you like, showed them in a lineup, they wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, if like uh, like Keith Stanfield or like I'm trying to think of or like um, Snap Finger Famous, Snap Finger Famous, like Riz Ahmed, they got they both get cast in this new action uh, buddy. Co- uh, buddy cop thing I'd be like oh sick that was a sick cast like but like I don't think and a lot, I think around film Twitter people would be super excited for that because these two characters are going to either be going back and forth with each other or teaming up to do something whatever this fictional movie that I'm not I'm going to make is going to be that just wouldn't be a thought to like every regular day people they'd just be like oh I, I think I've seen them in that one thing 
Yeah, it's an interesting uh, bubble that we live in. Sometimes is film we have Twitter to think destroying about... films. No, I think film Twitter just convinced all films are already destroyed. Mm. But that's a topic for another day. Guys, thank you for listening to the Nerd Soup Podcast. Like I said, we won't be back until maybe next Friday. But we should have a full full staff by then. Hopefully Teddy will clear his schedule. Yeah, we'll see and we we'll see what we'll be dropping while at TIFF. So make sure you're following us. Get some updates on some flicks that you've been wanting to see. Yeah, so we'll uh, definitely follow us on Twitter and Instagram. We'll try to document as much as we can. But until then... Until then, I bow out at the last minute and end up staying home. And then Aaron has to do all of it. I don't care. That could happen. Damn, we were making some good points in that video. Hey guys, Aaron and Nerd Suit Monkey here. Before we end this video, I want to give a quick shout out to our Patreon supporters. What can I say about you guys that I haven't already said about myself? You are the most important part of the channel and the main reason we keep going strong. Like Bo says, you keep the lights on in the fridge, so the fridge is full. Or, or something like that. So, from everyone here at Nerd Soup, I'd like to thank you guys for your continued support. If you're interested in joining the ranks of our patron supporters, head over to patreon.com slash nerdsoup and check out the rewards we offer to our patrons. We recently dropped some new stickers for you guys to check out, or you could choose a tier that will allow you to select a movie, show, or video game for us to review. We've got a full slate of fan-suggested reviews coming your way, and we're really excited about the chance to review some of those movies and shows. We've also got t-shirts, mugs, behind-the-scenes videos showing how we bring our videos to life. And once again, thank you to all our Patreon pledgers who have been supporting us throughout the years. Without you, we wouldn't be able to convert all your pledges into cryptocurrency, so thank you from my future self for making us rich.